we're building a platform to help people understand data and then use it more effectively to solve problems in a variety of places. It's fascinating because data is everywhere and data is the key to solving so many problems. Welcome to Innovator Tribe Outside the Bubble. A show about bridging the gap between the inspiration of an idea to the creation of a product. Come on, man. How's, 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 your, how's your year been so far? Man, it's been, it's been all positivity, you know, affirmations and focus, all of that good stuff, man. Just receiving I love all the positive energy. Man, affirmations. I really haven't gotten to affirmations, but I do, I do like to, you know, meditate. I, you know, practice meditation. I can't say I do it every day, but I definitely try to. And, you know, those early morning uh, routines, whether it's meditation, whether it's affirmations, uh, whether it's reading, you know, I definitely feel like helps successful people get their morning started right. Yeah, yeah, man. Like, this is real short. That first hour of the day is just so critical. So, like, yeah, I, if, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna go the affirmation route, man, like, I promise you, it's it's gonna be nothing but good stuff happen afterwards. So cool, cool, cool. Uh, so today's episode, man, I'm I'm so excited. We have Jeff Nelson, uh, one of the co-founders of Blavity.com. Uh, who also just recently launched uh, a new startup called Sinchappy, which he actually founded because uh, as a developer, he just had some challenges that he just decided that he needed to create a solution for. And that was the main premise of him working on Sinchappy. Yeah. And, and with this episode, you're really going to get the journey to his entrepreneurial ups and downs. Like he talks about 10 plus different startups that he dabbled in before really landing on Blavity and, and finding his strides to, to do Chinchapi as well too. So you want to hear like a true example of like how you don't really just get lucky. Opportunity is met by preparation and like just having the tenacity to punch through idea after idea to, you know, finally land on something that, that really hits that stride. Yeah. You know, the the interesting that I found about the story behind Blavity is uh, the founders all actually met at Wash U in, in St. Louis. And from there, you know, worked on, you know, I think 10 plus different ideas before they landed on Blavity. And as Ahmad said, just punching through just different ideas to eventually landing on something that hit. And as we all know, uh, Blavity.com is a, a runaway success right now. In the episode... We're also going to get into a pretty, a pretty interesting story about ultimatum that the founders actually received from a potential investor. And I'm not going to give you all the details. You got to listen to the episode to actually hear the story. Uh, but it was, it was a pretty interesting story. <laughs> yeah, I think we broke an exclusive about that story. Listen in to the end so you can hear that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. Before we get into it, please, please, please don't forget to make sure you subscribe to uh, outside the bubble podcast and definitely make sure you leave a rating hit that five star review please <laughs> uh, i don't think we can tell them to leave five star reviews but if you're inclined to definitely leave a five star review uh but in all seriousness you know we definitely appreciate your guys' feedback so you know leave a rating uh add some commentary as well and, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to leverage this feedback to improve the show and make sure that we're providing value to our audience and to our listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Toye is always that the, the words are a reason and, and, and wise words that <laughs> smooths it all over. I'm just like, leave me the five star review. I need it. <laughs> I'll take I'll take the five star review as well. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Well, um, yeah, man, like, let, let's get into the show. Let's do it. We have uh, Jeff Nelson here and you know, I just like usually like to kind of talk about, you know, how we're able to uh, get our guests on the show. One of my uh, good friends from DePaul actually was the one that introduced us, uh, LaJoy. 
And uh, Ahmad actually knows LaJoy as well because he actually went to Nepal with us too. So Small world. It's a very small world. <laughs> and funny enough, actually, when I was uh, going through my, my LinkedIn, I saw we actually had a, a slew, a whole bunch of more connections. Uh, oh, really? Funny enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had like eight mutual connections or something. So nice. Yeah. Probably, uh, I, I, and, and, I, and I saw that you actually lived in Chicago at one point too. Yeah, I was born and raised in Chicago. So that's that's still home for me. Um, oh, really? What, what, uh, what high school did you go to? I went to Morgan Park. So that's where LaJoy and I actually met. We went to high school together. And we've been friends ever since. Morgan what? Park alum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that, that is crazy. That is crazy. And it's one of those things where we've been friends for, you know, when you're friends with somebody for so long, you forget how you actually met them. And you forget, you forget where the friendship actually started. So, yeah, we, we've, been, we've known each other through all the different phases of our life. So, you know, she, she's that's obviously nuts. good people, as you know. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, get into it. Um, Jeff Nelson, one of the uh, co-founders of Blavity, uh, one of uh, the founder of, uh, is it Sinchapi? You got it. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and it seemed like just kind of, you know, doing my own research on your background, it seems like you have just a variety of different entrepreneurial uh, endeavors as well. I think I think in, in one of the uh, quotes that I saw said that you were like shoveling snow or something like that, <laughs> like 10 years <laughs> old. Is that like yeah. your first business? Yeah, I've been I've been out here hustling for a while, but uh, shoveling snow. Um, had a, I had a candy, you know, a little candy store on my block when I was younger. Just any anything to to try to make a buck and, and solve a need that I saw. I was I was out there doing it. Hey, hey I sold tall tees from my locker room when I was in high school. Like oh, that. Nice. <laughs> I, I that that used to, that that was good business back in like two thousand two like that that time like that was Indeed. real good business <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely um, yeah that's 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 great man so we're definitely gonna get into that uh, just because I feel like typically you know many founders that I've spoken to you know the business that they're kind of they're working on now or they're known for usually is not the the first business that they've started you know so whether it's uh, an unincorporated business or, you know, just kind of like, you know, hustling tall tees <laughs> 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 or, or, you know, hustling, you know, those, uh, those burn CDs, uh, you, you know, back somewhere. in the day, like you gotta start somewhere, right. Just, you know, find an opportunity and, 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 and trying to, uh, you know, be service that market. So, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll let Ahmad go ahead and, uh, and ask one of our first questions that we like to ask our, our, all of our guests. Yeah. I mean, this is like, one of our, our key questions, and it really sets the tone for like why we even have this show. And that question is, what is the song like for for us? For us, it's like more so of a hip hop song. But like, what is what is that song that gets you in the zone before you're headed into a big meeting or about to, about to make a pitch? That that song that gets you into the zone. Oh man, <laughs> that's that's a that's a that's such a tough question, you know, because. Uh... You, that's like what's my theme song and uh <laughs> man y- y'all are putting me on the spot i, I will say yeah keep it keep it 100 please, please. <laughs> <laughs> if, it's, if it's little yachty it's okay if it's, if it's young thug we, yeah, I like if you like kodak that. black that's fine too <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, it's like as i as i try to pull up my itunes it's like yo what's the what's the last song i was listening to <laughs> um it, it, it's funny because you know i used to uh in addition to my early entrepreneurial pursuits. I used to, uh, I, and, I, and I hesitate to say this because I, I don't want to. I don't want to imply any more seriousness than than should be. But I used to rap like when I was younger, and I did make one one rap album. You know, so oh, um, okay, okay, okay. I, and, and, and I don't say that to suggest like I was any good or it was like <laughs> it, it was. Is this, just, is like, this anywhere online? Like, can we find like a YouTube clip? Of you freestyling or something? See, it's so embarrassing that I tried to purge it from <laughs> from the internet. You know, there there are probably it's probably one of those things. Like as I go on in life, and it, you know, if if I if I manage to to make it major somewhere, this clip will probably some clip will probably resurface, and it's like, oh, Jeff Nelson back, you know, when he was like sixteen years old rapping, and he's terrible, and you know, the internet will probably <laughs> <laughs> uh, give me a bunch of crap for it. But um, the reason I bring that up is because. You know, I, I actually um, I used to make beats as well. So so a lot of times I actually will listen to 
like old beats that I've made um, as my theme song, not as a theme song, but just like to kind of get me in a zone because it, it takes me back to a time in life where, you know, you, you, you kind of, I think you come of age at, at different points in time, mm. but um, it, it definitely takes me back to a time when I was just kind of like discovering myself and, and, and really kind of um, towing the line of adulthood. Um, and so I don't say that to like cop out on, on choosing a theme song, but if I had to, if I had to choose a theme song, man, it's, ah, oh, let's see who it's, it's probably, I, I would say it's probably, it, it, there are lots of different choices I can make, but I, I will say lose yourself by Eminem is it, probably Classic. Yeah, yeah, one, I, one that I would choose. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that that's very thematic to just the idea of like, okay, you're going to give a pitch, you're going to a customer meeting. And especially like given my background, like I always tell people being from the south side of Chicago, being, a, you know, a black kid born in the inner city, raised in the inner city, didn't go to private school. I went to Morgan Park. Um, Morgan Park is not, you know, it's, it's a some smart kids that go there, but it's, it's not like a magnet school or anything like that. So I always tell people, you know, I'm not I'm not supposed to be here. Right. Mm. Like a lot of the kids mm. that I went to school with you know, they unfortunately took different paths or different situations happened to them. And uh, they, they got involved in, in circumstances that probably aren't ideal what they envisioned their lives being like. And, and I, I could have easily been one of those people. Like I got lucky. And so um, I always remember that. And so mm-hmm. I just try to lose myself in, in the moment and, and enjoy it and never take it for granted. So I guess, you know, lose yourself is, is probably that song that I most often listen to to get into the zone. Yo, that's that's definitely a good one. I think that's the first time we've heard that song in particular, and it just it just makes so much sense that that would be a great it's song a to kind of get oh, you yeah, hyped, you know, right before <laughs> anything. So one of the, one of the things that we definitely like to discuss is really, you know, not only talking about you know where you are right now with your startup, but really having the conversation about you know how you went from the spark of the idea to you know whether it's the mvp whether it's the prototype uh really just kind of talk about that journey so you know obviously the before you started working on sinchappi you were working on blavity right and yeah. you know blavity like from what i can tell it's, it's, it's just been huge growth over the last two years you know just you know it's, and it's not the first time that somebody has tried to do that but you guys did it very, very well, and the 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 growth over just the last two years has been has been amazing. And to, just to think that I was literally one person removed from the person that actually helped create Blavity is kind of blowing my mind because I literally have been watching, um, you know, your, your guys and your platform uh, for a while now. Um, so, so I, I I really want to kind of understand like how you guys were able to. Uh, to, to even from the, the spark of the idea to actually getting something out there. Can you, can you kind of tell us about that journey a little bit? The journey to Blavity is really interesting. You know, we've four individuals, myself included, founded the company. Morgan, um, who's the CEO, who is just an amazing woman. Love Morgan to death. And I think she's one of the, the most talented people in, in just one of the biggest visionaries I've ever encountered. She's really done such a great job of taking, you know, what I bring to the table and then our other co-founders, Aaron Samuels and Jonathan Jackson, and really driving that ship and and taking it to a level that we could have never imagined. And so the four of us all went to Washington University in St. Louis, and we were all connected amongst each other in some interesting ways. And so I was Aaron's mentor. So he uh, graduated a year after I did, and I was his mentor when he uh, came to visit WashU. I showed him around campus, hosted him, was kind of like his big brother all throughout his, the time that we overlapped there. And then Morgan was a year under Aaron. They were in the same honorary. Aaron was kind of a mentor to Morgan. I was Morgan's RA uh, before her freshman year. So she did a, did a summer program. And I was her RA for that program. I was student body president one year, and then the next year Morgan was student body president, and she served in my administration. So we, you know, we were connected in those ways. And Morgan and I have been v- very good friends for a long time. And then Jonathan was a year under Morgan. Morgan was kind of his mentor. 
he was in the same honorary that Morgan and Aaron were in. So the four of us, you know, we were we were all connected in these in interesting ways. And how Blavity came about was I was in the Bay Area at the time and Morgan was also in the Bay Area. So us, you know, being good friends, being black in the Bay Area, working at tech companies, um, there aren't many other people that could relate to what we, what we were experiencing. So, you know, we just hung out all the time. And from day one, we were always uh, thinking about, hey, what, what are we going to build? Like, what, what's the problem that we're going to solve? Because ultimately, the type of people that we are, we, we both were student body president. It's like we like to solve problems and we like to set that vision and set that direction. And so Morgan and I have probably started like 12 different companies. Um, you know, <laughs> obviously most of them have failed, uh, but you know, we've had some, we've had some crazy ideas. Some, some ideas that I think were really, really good, but the timing wasn't off, was off. And with Blavity in particular, and I give Morgan all the credit there, there's one, there's one um, small piece of credit that I will take and I'm proud to take it and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. But I give Morgan all the credit because she really saw the vision of what Blavity could be mm-hmm. in a way that I, I couldn't and, and that I think, you know, other people c- could maybe could understand a little bit, but really couldn't see fully what it could become. And I remember a conversation we had, you know, more, like Morgan was really into social media, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. I don't use any of that. Um, like, I, I think I think I have a Twitter account and, and, you know, like, I don't really know how to use it. Like, I'll try to I'll try to um, I'll try to <laughs> I'll end up like retweeting myself on accident because I'm trying to, <laughs> <laughs> to like have like a Twitter. Like, I, I, I do. I don't really know how to use it. But that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's embarrassing because I always tell people like I, I make tech, but I, I don't really use it. Like I, I, <laughs> discover, I discovered Netflix like a year ago, and it's it's been a it's been a game changer for me personally. But it's, it's just like yo, I, I, I would have been Netflix and chilling a long time oh, ago. Oh, <laughs> if, I, <laughs> <laughs> if that was around like five years ago, right? Uh, well, maybe it was, but I, I just didn't know about it. But, and so, anyway, um, Morgan would always say stuff to me like. Yo, I was looking on Black Twitter and such and such, and I was just like, "What? What is Black Twitter? Like, what is this a website? Is it like BlackNotTwitter.com? Is it is it like a theme you make on Twitter? Like, you make the Twitter instead of blue is black? I had no idea what she was talking about, it. and so she broke it down to me, and she really kind of saw how you know millennials of color were creating a space when that space wasn't created for them. It's like Twitter mm-hmm. existed, and and people found each other, and they were having these conversations that were hilarious and politically insightful and thoughtful and these mm-hmm. debates. And they, they created that and they, dis- and, and they would discover that amongst each other. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. But nobody was creating a platform that was specifically catered towards that demographic or, or having those types of conversations. And so that's where Blavity kind of started, which is when, when I got introduced to the term Black Twitter and, and Morgan was like, yo, we got to do something about this. And I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. Um, the small piece of credit that I will take is when we were pitching Blavity early on um, and we would go talk to investors and we would go talk to different people. And, and as you, you, you know, most of the investors, um, you know, with whom you're going to interact um, aren't going to be black. Right. And so they're not going to necessarily get the problem, Mm. especially around the time we were pitching this in in early 2014, even a little bit before that, late 2013. And so one, you know, somebody and I think a couple people told Morgan, like, okay, cool, I'm digging this tech media company, millennials, but I don't like the name Blavity. Right. It it you know, it just implies black people, black gravity. Okay, that's cool. But I don't like the name Blavity. You change the name. And we'll invest in you. And wow. Morgan came to me and was like, yeah, we got to think of a new name. They, they want to change it. They don't want us to call it Blavity. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's got to be Blavity. That, no, that's, oh, the, that's like the one thing I'll take credit for is I was like, no, Morgan, like you, you have a vision. And, and we've talked about this vision and the name Blavity is perfect for that vision. The Blavity, as I mentioned, is Black Gravity. And that actually comes from like, I don't, I don't think we invented the term. That was when we were at WashU. That was just something, a phenomenon that we would describe. And, and I actually have to give a shout out, shout out 
to my godson's mother, uh, Danielle, who says she invented the term. So I have to I have to give her a shout out on the record. <laughs> so she doesn't, she doesn't revoke my, <laughs> my godfather privileges. But um, it was a term that described how when you you know we were all at a at a PWI, a predominantly white institution, and so at lunchtime there's the black table. And it's like all the black students who, even if they didn't know each other, they'd all sit at the same table. And, uh, and that was like, oh, this is blavity, black gravity. Oh, we all gravitate towards one another. And so that kind of experience, and we, and we wanted to take that to another level and, and build, build a tech platform that gave everybody that same sort of experience where black people and millennials of color no matter where they were, and even if they didn't know each other, even if they didn't have the same background, they could find each other and figure out what the commonalities were, but also the differences and engage with one another. And so that's how Blavity came about. So we, you know, we really went full, full steam ahead on it in 2014, late 2014. And, you know, we've been hustling and I give all the credit to my co-founders, Morgan, Jonathan and Aaron. They are just excellent people. Like I'm, I'm, I'm privileged and honored to be a part of that. You know, like being the CTO. Um, obviously, you know, I do play a role in in building the technology and, and making sure that the stories uh, that we tell can can be disseminated and and we can uh, continue to foster that community and help it grow. But really, the success of Blavity has everything to do with Morgan's vision and her leadership, Aaron's ability to understand creativity, artistry, and culture, and then Jonathan's ability to understand storytelling and to tell our story and help other people tell their stories. Um, that's really how it took off. Man, that's, um, you have the words of a, of, a, of a true leader right there in a the sense um, of just reckon, giving credit where credit is due and just also just... Um, you know, sticking with your guns when it came to like the name, um, and I'm, it's 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 interesting because like um, it didn't just happen by accident. Like you guys, even during the journey you described, there were there was preparation that occurred um, along that journey. Like you 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 got your um, you know your educational chops. You know, at Wash U, you were um, going to different um, companies. You know, just went out into the bay. I, and I also know, like, you spent time at like Mailchimp as well, and right. just like diff- different building blocks. This will help get you to where you you're, you're at right now with that teamwork that you had with with Morgan and yourself and the and the rest of the co-founders to you know execute that vision. And, and now and now it's like all of that came to together to to provide you a, a, a great foundation. To now you're working on a, a new startup. What's the distinction now? From from all those past experiences to now being a, a founder um, with, with this with this new uh, with this new tool um, and, and, and product that that you're creating today, um, because one I, I reckon I, I empathize with it a lot because with with my current like my nine to five like we we work with a, a lot of historical hotel data, so I I'm really interested to to hear the the, um, the connections between that. Yeah, uh, Sinchapi presents so many unique challenges. Um, some are self-imposed because with Sinchapi, I'm a, I'm a solo founder. So it's like just the burden of starting a company and, and founding it and trying to grow it um, is it, difficult. Fortunately, I, I do have a great team that I've been able to assemble to, to help me to build, continue to build Sinchapi and, and carry out that vision. But with Blavity, Blavity was hard and continues to be hard, even with the four of us. And I think what was special about Blavity is that when we were creating it, initially people didn't see the problem. And we have the ability to say, you know what, we're going to not rely on investors up front. Like we know we can build this and we know the problem exists because we live it and see it every day and, and our friends experience it. So we're, we're actually just going to go out and build it. And once we build it, we know that they will come. And that's that's exactly what has happened? Not not to say that yo like oh it's smooth sailing from here. We we still got a lot of work to do with Blavity and, and, and a lot of challenges ahead. But how that compares to Sinchapi? Sinchapi is first of all a B two B enterprise big data company, and so the challenge there is that in order to succeed, I've got to get an audience and try to close deals 
with some of the biggest enterprises and in some of the you know uh, mid market companies out there. So automatically, when you go from having a B two C company like Blavity to a B two B company like Sinchappy, you you really just can say, well, I'm just going to build it anyway, and then like I'm going to make them come. It's like no, you actually do have to play the enterprise sales cycle game, which is just hard. It's extremely hard, especially when when you're a startup. Um, so that's that's a major challenge there. And I think what a lot of founders who are minority will will get, but many investors don't necessarily understand it. And I don't think it's I don't necessarily think it's because they don't want to. I think part of it is because they can't. Um, the experience of having black guy walk into a boardroom and sit across from this this CEO of a fortune, whatever hundred company who's maybe in his fifties or sixties, um, that visual there, there, there's just this assumption of not taking me as seriously as mm-hmm. they would someone that maybe looked like they did 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I don't help that because sometimes I wear tape on my glasses. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, how you feel. sometimes I do that. And, and sometimes I may walk around in a hoodie and instead of, instead of a collared shirt, Right. But but there but even so, even if even if you dress the part right, sometimes there's this yeah. this assumption that, OK, already you're a startup. So you're disadvantaged. But also you don't look the part of someone that usually sits across the table from me that I negotiate, that I try to close a deal with. So there are all these preconceived notions that they have. Yeah. And that's that's extremely difficult because I don't I, like I don't think because this kind of dovetails into the conversation about diversity in tech and, and all that. I don't think people are uh, have bad intentions. Like, I don't think people are sitting and saying, I don't want to hire minorities or I don't want to make deals with minorities. But people do what they're what they're comfortable doing. Right. And so yeah. the, way, the way deals get done is that, you know, they don't necessarily get done in boardrooms. They get done, you know, in, in social situations, whether it's on the golf yeah. course or whether it's at a bar or something like that. And I do play golf and I do go to bars, but that it's like if if I'm going to go to a bar with a a 60 year old white guy, do we even have the same life experience to even begin to have a conversation that's not awkward so we can develop (laughs) chemistry and close that deal? Right. And and, 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 And so those things are extremely challenging because you're held to the same standard and and you should be. Um, where investors and and people are going to evaluate you on your ability to close those types of deals. But no matter how much education I have, no matter um, what capabilities I have, there's always going to be this this bar, um, or I don't even want to classify it as a bar. There's always going to be this role that I have to, to assume that is not necessarily natural to me because I've got to go into that world and I've got to try to fit into that world. But the physical manifestation of, of who I am, the things that I cannot change automatically put me at a disadvantage. Um, yeah. and, and one that I didn't necessarily appreciate um, the difficulty prior to, to doing this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just a, uh... You know what we what I think the the psychology term is implicit bias, right? Where it's like you said, it's not something that is overt. They're like, oh, I'm not gonna you know give this person a contract, or I'm not gonna invest in this company. But when they're they're doing the pattern matching, right? This person doesn't fit the typical modes uh, right. that I am used to, like whether it's investing in or whether it's in believing that this software is gonna solve the problem that I'm trying to solve. And you know, I think. You know, just having that understanding is very important because specifically what you're talking about right now is really what you're talking about is like you already have a product, right? And you're talking about scaling it. Like how do you scale this business? And those are just real obstacles that, you know, a lot of people that do not fit, you know, that 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 mold are just going to have to deal with not only in technology, but just in any business in general. Right. And I, I'm so I'm so glad that you actually brought that up. But I kind of want to I want to take it a, a kind of a step backwards, right? Because uh, one thing that you talked about within about Blavity as well with uh, Sinchappy is the validation, the market validation, right? And I really want to kind of understand, you know, what were those initial market validation that you kind of went through with Blavity, right? Because Blavity is B two C, Sinchappy is B two B, right? I feel like B two B is probably a little bit harder. 
to to validate because it's not just about you know putting a website up, sending some traffic, whether it's through SEO, through SEM, or other you know sort of like you know marketing campaigns. So I'm kind of curious, was it, were there any sort of a MVP MVPs that you actually kind of put out to validate your your your, your ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll talk about um, briefly, just touch on that from from the Blavity standpoint, and, and then talk about since happy uh, for, for Blavity. Yeah. I mean, even it, you're right. It's a lot easier for, for Blavity to, to build something, uh, do some SEO magic, word of mouth and, and get viral traction and get people there, especially when there's such a, such a huge and into what us, what seems to be an obvious need uh, for what Blavity is feeling. Um, and not to suggest that it's, it's very, it's like easy to, to create something that's going to be successful doing that. But it's at least easy to, to get started and see whether you have something that's that's worth continuing to pursue or whether you ought to pivot. With Sinchapi, you're right. You can't just build something and send people to it, especially with the type of platform we're building. And so for the listeners out there, um, go to www.sinchapi.com. That's C-I-N-C-H-A-P-I.com. Uh, because whenever I try to explain Cinch Happy to people, they're just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But they have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, what, what we're doing is we're building a platform to help people understand data and then use it more effectively to solve problems in a variety of places, whether it's, you know, in the financial sector and detecting fraud and fighting it and eliminating it whether it's you know preventing cyber intrusion and cyber attacks and hacking, whether it's to help um, you know um, hospitals and health organizations to understand how disease is spread within communities to better treat people. Uh, it, it's fascinating because data is everywhere and data is the key to solving so many problems because really data is knowledge. And if we have knowledge and we can understand then we can figure out solutions to some of the pressing problems in the world. And so what we're doing with Sinchapi is trying to build a platform that makes it easier for people to do that. And we, and we think that we can make it easier for people to do that by using what's, you know, machine learning, which is using the intelligence of a computer and combining that with human intelligence to deliver better outcomes and make it easier for people to process data. So some, some, um, you know, specific, outcomes of what we provide is that we allow people to query and search data using natural language. I always tell people it's like you can just pick up your phone and say, hey, Siri, you know, which which of if you've got like a, a financial company, you can say, hey, Siri, which accounts look like they have fraudulent activity last week? Something like that. Like the questions you have in your mind, you don't have to like translate that to computer code or database queries to get the answer. You can just ask those things to our platform. Uh, we give you visualizations for your data on the fly, and then we let you just click a few buttons to actually automate some pre very precise actions to take on data in real time. And so that's what we're trying to enable people to do. It's, it's really cool stuff, and, and it's, it's incredibly powerful. And so how I arrived at that, because people are always like, yo, you, you've done Blavity, and that's great, that's amazing. Were you like, why'd you decide to, to start another company? Like, what, what's wrong with that was, you? That was going to be the next question. This is like, are you, are you like crazy or something like that? Are you, are you insane? And, and, you know, the answer is probably yes to, to that question. But <laughs> the, the reason why I started, decided to start Sinchappi is because prior to Blavity, the places where I worked, you know, I, I started my career in the Bay Area working at Palantir. Um, you know, some of your listeners might have heard of Palantir. They might might know it is this like organization that does a lot of stuff with data, and they may be like looking at everybody's phone calls, which they're not doing. Which is but but that's like people's assumption of Palantir if they know about it. Um, but they just think it's like really secretive and cool, and they're like, "Yo, what did you do at Palantir? Can you tell me?" And I'm like, "No, I cannot." Um, but that's where I started my career, and and that's. Again, working with data and me being an engineer, you know, a software engineer and also working um, hand in hand and not only building the product, but actually deploying that product to customers. I saw firsthand the difficulty in one in general trying to solve problems with data, but also I saw how 
the tools that exist for working with data fall short of being usable for the average consumer, the, the average user, but also being um, unsuitable for the way that data exists in the world today. You know, many of these, these comp complex data tools were made 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And yeah. they, were, they were made for a time when data wasn't as large or as vast as it is now when data didn't change as frequently as it does now, and when data wasn't as unpredictable as it is now. And so I saw that, that problem and, and that frustration. And then mm -hmm. I went to work at MailChimp, which is, a, which is a B2C company, but again, it's solving huge data problems on the back end. And so, again, similar challenges in working with data tools that were inadequate for the ways in which data needs to be used today. And then, you know, I worked at Ionic Security, which is another um, B2B enterprise cybersecurity company. And, and I was actually building data platforms there because the tools that they were using were inadequate. And so I just saw this everywhere. And then I remembered, yo, in building Blavity, I also dealt with these problems like trying to, you know, deal with data in a way that felt unnatural given the set of tools that were available. And so being an engineer and, and being this, this you know, low key nerd that just likes to code all the time, most uh, engineers, like they're really into video games. I don't play video games. Really don't fit, like fit that mold. I, and I, I think that's I great that though. Mode. Yeah, I don't. But, and it's like, I try to get all, like people will start talking about those, like those things and I have no idea what they're talking about. So I try to pretend like I'm not a nerd, but I've got, I've got other nerd qualities. Um, but to get back to what I was saying, uh, starting since Chappie really came forth from having having those problems myself. And it's like, yo, like these these tools are not good. I spent more time trying to wrestle with the tools than I than I did actually solving the problems with the data, like the actual problems I set out to solve initially. And that was frustrating. And and I knew so many other people that had those problems um, that, you know, customers um, with whom I work, colleagues. Um, that were on my team, friends that worked at other companies. I saw that so often. When did you start, you know, uh, or what's been the key, like, moments of seeing the traction from the, the, the clients and customers you're trying to reach? Like, what, what's, what's been that experience? So that experience has been amazing. I'll talk about it <clears throat> from a couple of different standpoints. One is just talking to other developers who are like me, who aren't necessarily decision makers as an enterprise, but they are either working on side projects, they're building companies themselves, or they're working on projects at work. And they discover what we're doing and, and they reach out to me and, 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 and they're just like, oh man, this, this is exactly what I needed. Like this is, if I had to, to dream up the perfect set of tools for me to use, this would be it. Thank you so much for building this. Not and, and not only it doesn't stop there, it is, but it's like, how can I be involved? How can I help out? And you know, the cool thing about Sinchappy is that part of our platform is open source. So the database portion of the platform is called Concourse. Um, it's an open source database. You can get it from concoursedb.com. Um, and it's the source code is available on GitHub. And people, you know, we've got a community of thousands of developers that are using or can, and contributing to Concourse because they just think it's so cool. And we haven't, we haven't done marketing. I think like mm. me saying that website is probably the first time I've marketed it um, <laughs> since, since I've been working on it. And, and people wow. just discover it and they're like, man, this is so cool. Like I want to be a part of that. Um, and then on the customer standpoint, when you go to enterprises, we, we go through this, this, this customer discovery process, which is, which is, Absolutely, absolutely critical for anybody that's building a business, um, but especially B2B. So critical to go through customer discovery before you build an entire product and you find out nobody wants it. Right. Um, and, and so in going through customer discovery early on, what we were trying to figure out was what are the problems people want to solve with data so we could build something that would solve those problems. And the refrain that I kept hearing from people over and over and over again was, I don't actually know the problems that I can use, solve with this data because I don't know what's in it. 
I can't even begin. Like I can't in, invest time, money, people, whatever, in figuring out what's in all this data I'm collecting and figuring out if it's useful. Because if it's not, I've just I, I like I can't afford to make that investment and it doesn't pay off, mm. right? And so companies <clears throat> are sitting on troves and troves of data that could that could do so much. I mean, it's not even always just about making more money, but it, it's really about creating a better experience for their customers or really preventing themselves from getting hacked or being subjects of fraud or really like saving lives in some cases. Like I don't want to over, uh, you know, dr dramatize it or anything, but data can really, it, data can save lives. It can actually save lives. I mean, that's, that, that's really the truth of it. But yeah. if you, if you don't know what's in the data, you can't even begin to to do those things. And there's this huge tax that people pay up front to really try to use data because they've got to explore, they've got to figure out what's signal within the data, what's noise. And that was extremely hard to do. And so that was actually, that, that was more validation than someone telling me, I have problem X and if I had tool Y, I could solve it. Hearing mm -hmm. people say, I've got so much data and I don't even know what I can do with it was validation because that's exactly like how we were building this platform was to make it easy for people to take data from anywhere, whether it's from a legacy system, whether it's from an API online, whether it's from like a connected device on, on the Internet of Things, no matter where it comes from, we wanted to make it easy for people to bring that together and explore it and discover what's happening in real time and across time, and then automate actions against that data. And hearing people say that I've got a data discovery problem was the validation that we needed. And, and we showed them like, hey, you know, you could just take data and drop it in here and then ask questions about the data. The, the types of questions you have in your head, you could just pose those to the platform and then get those answers immediately. And, and people just responded so well to that and they continue to respond well to it. And and we're having such a great time building it out. That's 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 dope, man. Um, you know, I, I can tell I can tell you're very passionate <laughs> about it. And, you know, and it, it actually kind of wanted to even ask you because you actually mentioned how, you know, you have developers reaching out to you and saying they want to be a part of it. Right. And one thing about, you know, not only building uh, an application or a business is recognizing, OK, these are my strengths. And how can I build a team around me to kind of shore up, you know, the things that I'm not so great at? And obviously, you know, you're very, you're a very technical person. And I'm, I'm kind of curious to know, like, how you went about building your team around, around Sinchapi. Yeah. So I think what you said about recognizing <clears throat> your strengths is so important. Um, I, I'm at a point in my life where I'm just very comfortable with who I am what my strengths are, what I'm not so good at. And I, and I do attribute that to getting married. So I got married like oh. uh, two, two years ago. And it's just this, um, even before getting married, like, you know, getting engaged and, and starting to date my wife when we did start date. So it's been like four years ago. But the reason why that's so important, um, and I think I, I can only speak for, well, I can only speak for myself, but I think most guys that I know and, and talk to, like when you're young and you're in you're, your 20s and you're young, a lot of what you do, like you make decisions that really don't make a lot of sense, but you do it because you're looking for affirmation either from uh, somebody that could be a potential partner or from friends or whatever. Like you're looking for that affirmation from other people. Um, mm -hmm. I, like I always say, you know, like being young and spending, like standing in line to get into a club and then spending 20, 20 at least $20 to get in and, and spending $10 on drinks and all that just to get the attention of somebody else uh, that you might want to date or something like in hindsight, that's, that's so crazy and ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're when it, 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 like, but when you're young and doing it, it's like, yo, that's, you got to play the game. You got You got to do yeah. that to, 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 to get what you're looking for. Right. Yeah, um, and yeah. once, and once I got to a point where I, I you know, I found um, the woman that I wanted to, to settle down with and, and I got married and was getting on that path to getting married. There's just this instant maturity that that kind of happens where you no longer feel the need to impress arbitrary people, right? <laughs> the, the, you, you quickly understand who's important and what's important. Yeah. And so that made me very comfortable in 
understanding who I am as a person and what my strengths are. And so that made it so much easier when looking for people to surround myself with for some chappy, identifying what I'm good at. So for instance, I'm really, really, really bad at like email in general, but also just like any sort of like communication. Um, and the reason that I'm super bad at communication is because the way that I operate is that I don't like to think while I execute. And that might sound strange, but when I, when I execute on things, I like it to just be systematic and mm-hmm. on just like, like boom, a math boom, problem. Boom. Exactly. It's like, you're like, I'm just a computer, like the CPU, just like churning instructions, like boom, boom, boom. And so because I like to, to execute in that fashion, I spend a large portion of my time thinking and problem solving and figuring things out so that when it's time to execute, I don't have to think. I just do because I've already thought about these problems and I've thought about the different trade-offs. So I'm just executing. Mm -hmm. The problem with communication and especially all the communication that happens is that you have to give, you know, thoughtful responses. But like if I get an email, I can't respond at the moment because it's like, well, this isn't, this isn't thinking time, this is executing time, but I can't execute on this because I haven't thought about it. So then that, you know, it, it gets, I end up responding to emails like three, mo- three months later and stuff like, hey, do you still need this? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's something that I recognize about me. And as you can see, like I understand why and I accept it. And so part of it is I, I have to surround myself with people that are one better at communication than I am, but also that are able to, to, handle the way I communicate, the way I, the way I communicate, you know, I've got a lot of things going on in my mind. So for people who work with me, they've got to be able to handle like, yo, if you send me an email and if it's something you really need, you got to call me, you got to text me, you got to, you got to say, yo, Jeff, I need this. Like, can can we get this done? And it'll, it'll get done. Um, But that, but that's extremely important. There there are lots of other examples, but it's having that ability to self-reflect and figuring out strategically what are the what are the things that I need to complement my skill set and and who can I surround myself with that has them, but also tactically and logistically on a day to day basis, what are those other things that I need for people to be able to handle about how I work, but also to bring to the table to better complete the the entire team's ability to function and execute. That's that's uh I mean that's so spot on um you know understanding not only you know what is the best way of communication you know I I I work in in product management so I'm working you know with just a variety of different uh, functional teams and you know some people are good with email some people are good over the phone sometimes you have to go and over and talk to somebody but it's important to understand okay what is the best way for me to get the the response that I need from this person. Absolutely. And, and, and being able to understand that and and actually execute against it. And the fact that you actually recognize, OK, I need to surround people. I need to surround myself with people who understand how I communi- can communicate the best way I communicate. I mean, that's very insightful. Yeah, uh, it, it, you have this common you have this common thing. It's just this this teamwork. And even with Chinchapi, um, um, some uh, advisor team looks like that's providing some, some mentorship with you as well. And then I, from some context clues, I, I didn't see any like official like article out there or anything, but it seems like you have like some early investments happening now with the company as well. Um, what's, what's, what's up next with um, the, the progression on, on your roadmap for, um, for, for 2017? 2017 is all about c- continuing to commercialize the platform that we built. So as I alluded to earlier, that enterprise sales cycle is hard and it's long, right? You know, like we, we've had great conversations with some some early potential customers, also some customers that, you know, we, we got to uh, do pilots and, and kind of be beta testers for what we're building. But it's continuing to, to have those conversations with big companies and close those deals um, and, and really get them using this platform and in seeing how it helps to solve their problems in ways that they couldn't solve before. Um, as you mentioned, like we were fortunate to be one of the uh, companies in the inaugural batch of the Cyber Launch Accelerator, uh, which is an accelerator that started last year based out of Atlanta. And, you know, we were one of seven companies that were in that first batch um, and we got some angel funding. Um, and so that allowed us to really do some really cool things and building out the platform last year and getting some early traction, uh, both on the customer standpoint, 
uh, point and also the developer standpoint. And so this year is all about continuing that growth uh, at some point, uh, raising some more money. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's really what it's all about. Um, and just continuing to, to solve those problems. But also, you know, I always tell people as, as a founder, you, you always have so many ideas in your head and you've got a vision that's so grand that if you told it to anybody else that, that you would scare them away. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I've just got such a huge vision for Sinchappi, not only with data. I mean, we've started with data. But my vision personally is this vision of computing without complexity. I just want things to be simple. Like I, I just want to like be able to have the tools that I have, like figure it out. Like I don't want, like I hate when I get, whether it's a new software or a new hardware and I have to tell it what I want. I just want you to figure it out, right? I want you to be able to anticipate based on the context clues of, what I'm doing, where I am, who I am, what's on my schedule, what's on my calendar. Just figure out, figure out what I need, figure out what I'm doing and do it for me. And that type of te technological vision is very key to this notion of computing without complexity. As Sinchapi, <clears throat> our guiding principle is that everything we do must be down with OPP. And for us, that means open and press play. It's got to be that simple. Clever. We, yeah, we, we don't. We don't. <laughs> not the naughty by nature song. That that is, you know, that that's not what it's still for. Um, <laughs> if you Google the naughty by nature song, you, it's like it's not. It's a not safe for for word version of what that's still for. But for us, it, it means open and press play. And, and what really underscores that is, if you get whether it's software or hardware, um, and and I think Apple is is one of the few companies that gets this right. You, you should just be able to open it and it should just work, right? Mm -hmm. you, should, you shouldn't have to customize it or, or fiddle with it or, or do all that. It should just work, right? Because machines are smart enough now where they, can, they should just be able to work for you. Obviously, um, we can make them smarter and we can train them and we can fine tune them, but there should be a baseline that just works. And that's mm -hmm. very central to my vision. And so what's next on this roadmap is, is continuing to build out that vision for data but also some other areas um, where we've got some ideas for ways we can have an OPP experience for consumers and businesses. Yeah, you got some serious milestones up ahead of you, and it's going to be um, exciting to see. Um, well, we're going to transition um, to one of our final segments um, of this show with the um, with we call it dropping gems because the the main the main yeah because I mean we're. Like every like our listeners are really at this cusp of like they they have this idea and they're really figuring out how to take that that first step and so the entire course of this conversation you've been providing a, a ton of insights for um, for our listeners just to really take action on that on that idea that's that's burning in the, in, the, in their in their belly right now so these questions are are, are going to be straightforward we're going to ask them we're going to ask we ask everybody these questions so um, yeah I'm just going to go ahead and kick it off. Um, with with the first one, what are the top three tools you would recommend for someone who's just starting on their journey? Yeah, so the first one of the first things you need is a calendar, whether it's an electronic calendar like Google Calendar or pen and paper. You need something to keep track of how you're spending time because time is the the most precious resource because you can't get more of it, and we all have the same amount of it, right? Everybody gets 168 hours in a week. And how you spend that is ultimately a measure of how successful you're going to be. Um, it's extremely important to um, engage in what I call self-preservation, which is eat, sleep, and exercise. So if you take 68 of that 168 hours, uh, 68 of those, and dedicate it to you know, self-preservation, that gives you about 9.8 hours a day to do that. And then you've got 100 other hours left in the week to theoretically work on whatever you work, want to work on. And so maybe you've got a nine to five full-time job, which is 40 hours a week. Maybe you volunteer um, at, at an or in an organization or a church or you're involved in something else that, that may take up some time. Perhaps you have a family, a significant other, kids, whatever the case may be. But you'll quickly find that 168 hours sounds like a lot when you, when you just throw that number out there. But when you actually do the math and allocate it, 
it is not enough, <laughs> right? And so, right. you know, not only does that show you the need to prioritize, but it shows you the need to understand exactly how you're spending your time. So having a calendar to not only keep up with appointments, obviously, but just to have a visual representation of where your time is allocated and, and how you're using each hour to progress towards your goals is extremely important. So that's the one tool that um, I would say, you know, a- everybody can can get access to that in some form. But that's one thing that's incredibly essential. The second thing I, w- I will say is, is having a support system, whatever form that takes, whether that's, you know, friends, significant other, parents, family members, but having no entrepreneur, even if they're a solo founder, goes through that journey alone. And you have to have people, even if you don't talk to them about what you're going through, even just to have people there to, to support you emotionally in whatever way you need is extremely important because startups suck and they are hard. And being a founder <laughs> is, I mean, it's, it is the most That's deflating real. thing. Yeah, it's so deflating. Like for all the success that I've had with Blavity and Sinchappi, like I could, I could count <laughs> the number of days. Where I'm like, man, this is great. But I can't count because there, there's it's so numerous the days, and I'm just like, yo, this sucks. Why am I doing this? Like waking up, and I'm just like, oh man, like yesterday was horrible. But I always wake up with that renewed sense of like, yo, like this vision, I'm doing the right thing because mm-hmm. even in the face of that, even in the face of rejection or or things sucking, I wake up and I'm like, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything other than what I'm doing, and that's wow. extremely important. But immediately after you get that rejection, it will be hard to think that way. So you got to have some type of support system where you can go to and lean on them. Um, and, and so that's the, the second thing that I would say people who are ready to embark on this journey needs. Um, and then the third thing that I'll say is you, you really need some type of, um, I guess, and I guess this is kind of similar to a support system, but you need something else. And investors will tell you this as well. Like they, they don't, they often, when, when they talk to founders, they want to know what else you're interested in. If you have no life outside of the startup, um, that may sound good on paper. It's like, yo, you're like completely dedicated, but it's actually dangerous because you don't have any perspective. You have no perspective on, what anyone who's not doing a startup can be into or think about or feel, right? And that's actually really dangerous. So you mm. need some kind of a hobby. And, and whether that's like a sport you play, whether it's an instrument, whether you have a, a favorite show like you watch on, on, on Netflix, like this awesome you know platform I just discovered a year ago, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is, like you need something outside of your startup so that you can have that escape because it will keep you sane. Because um, just like always dedicating every hour of the day to your startup is not healthy and you will burn out. Like you got to eat, you got to sleep, you got to exercise. You have to have, you know, another person or other people there to support you and to lean on them. You also just got to have other activities to give your brain space to, to focus on other things so that whatever processes are churning in the background to make you a better founder can actually uh, go into motion and do that work that's necessary. Well, I, I think you actually uh, kind of touched on our next question. And our next question is, what do you do to keep sane? And I think, uh, well, I guess you didn't really go into it, what it was for you. So, I mean, what are those th- what, what are those things that you do to keep yourself sane? So I am fortunate enough to have two kids. I have an eight-year-old son and an um, 18-month-old daughter. So... Wow. Um, that, that's what I do, um, a lot of times when I'm not working, I can't say that they keep me sane, <laughs> they, they me <laughs> sane but, uh, you know, really just taking joy and, um, experiencing life vicariously through them in many ways. Like my son, he's eight. He, I uh, just started playing basketball and, you know, me not being athletic, um, like <laughs> he didn't have any like predisposed basketball. Pre- predisposure to, to basketball. So he went in like not knowing anything. Um, and he's been playing for like 
three weeks and um, he's already learned so much and he's so excited about it. So seeing him experience those things and being able to be a part of that and practice with him and go to his games, um, seeing my daughter grow from this tiny little little person to um, this baby that's walking around and, and I'm sure she's like cursing me out or talking back, but I can't understand. Like she's not a standard <laughs> words. It's like, it's like a Kevin Hart joke. Like I'm sure yeah, it's like yeah. it's on the voice. Like I'm sure it's she's being disrespectful. Um, but seeing her just, <laughs> uh, just seeing her develop that personality has been fascinating. So that's definitely one thing. Uh, so our, our last question <clears throat> And I'm I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm really excited to hear your answer about this because I feel like every answer you've given (laughs) has not been expected. (laughs) I'm curious to go, no, where where are you going to go with this one? This will be fun. Um, (laughs) uh, Okay. So, what is something that you do not want an app to replace? The one thing that you can't trade it is family. And I think. One of the things I have to, to, to constantly remind myself of is that you can never get too busy for family. You know, like it's very easy to get caught up in, man, like looking at my calendar and my 168 hours in a week, I've got so much going on. And then three months have passed and you haven't talked to your parents, you haven't talked to your siblings, you haven't talked to your friends and you miss out or, or something happens. And, um, you know, you, you regret those things. And so I, I would never want technology to replace, especially my kids, right? Because that, you know, that's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me is, is being a dad. Like people say that and I didn't understand it until I became a dad. But when you, when you have kids and it's like, you're instantly in love, it's kind of irrational. It's like, yo, I just met you, but I love you and I'll do anything for you. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> Um, and and it, it's such a beautiful feeling that I would never ever want to app to to replace that because it can never be authentic. Wow, that's that's definitely that's definitely um we we definitely haven't had that answer before. Um, and honestly, I got to say that this has definitely have been has been one of my uh, favorite uh, episodes so far. Um, you know, just sure. just the uh, the humility and. And and the realness that you've actually brought to your your whole experience from, you know, from you know high school, right? Like the fact that I actually yeah. know somebody that you went to high school with, uh, to your experience at WashU, to you bouncing around to you know the, from the Bay to Atlanta, et cetera. It's definitely been a very very uh, great conversation. Appreciate it. I man, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you guys and, and being on the show. Uh, honored to have been a guest and to have been invited. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, we're, we're honored that you took the time out and being able to, um, you know, share your story. It's, it's, I know our listeners are going to, you know, really take a lot away from it. I, I want to go back and listen to it and take some notes from, from your story because I could relate to a lot of the points you made. But yeah, th- thanks again, man. I pr- really appreciate it. My pleasure. And just uh, just lastly, before we go ahead and close out, uh, how, how can people get in contact with you as far as like, you know, Twitter or or any way that uh, you, you prefer to be contacted? Yeah. So my uh, Twitter handle, I think, since I don't actually really use it, <laughs> I've, I've, I've tried to use it a little more, uh, but it's Jeff four, like the number four code. Um, so that's Jeff, the number four code. So you can follow me on Twitter. Um, also, you know, I'm on LinkedIn as well. It's like the it's like the only social networks I use are LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, but yeah, you can or you can follow me on GitHub. I'm on I'm on GitHub a lot because I code a lot, and so I'm JT Nelson um, at GitHub. If you're a developer and you want to follow me there or work, you know, just work on some of the stuff that we're doing at Sinchappy. Um So yeah, that's how to get in touch with me. And one one thing I wanted to just say really quickly is that I'm really passionate about helping mentoring people, whether it's like helping them become better developers or also helping them become better entrepreneurs. So like a lot of people say, you know, like reach out to me if you have questions, but like I I actually would be honored if people um, did have questions that where I could be helpful and if they did reach out, um, I'd be so honored to help because a lot of people helped me along the way and I definitely want to give back in the same spirit. That's, that's, that's dope, man. That's dope. Uh, once again, Jeff Nelson, uh, co-founder of Blavity, uh, founder of Sinchappy, 
uh, all around awesome dude uh, from the South Side Chicago. South Side. <laughs> South Side. <laughs> On the Wild Hunters, baby. Uh, crazy 80s, baby. <laughs>